Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course that doesn't think of it as work. The point is just to enjoy yourself. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about command line tools. This comes from CompTIA Network Plus certification N10 004, section 5.1, that says, Given a scenario, we need to use a command line utility to look at the network and interpret the output. And it's going to take us through traceroute, IP config, if config, ping, ARP ping, and many, many more. So as we step through these, you'll start to see how you can work in a Windows and a Linux type environment to be able to see what's really going on out there on the network. Let's start our tour of command line utilities with ipconfig and ifconfig. Now, what these are used for is depending on what operating system you're on, you want to know what IP address and what IP information does this machine that we're using have configured inside of it. What's its IP address? What's its subnet mask? What gateway does it go to? What MAC addresses does it use? And depending on whether you're running in Linux or a Linux type environment or running in Windows, it'll be different commands. So if you're in Windows, you'll run ipconfig. And if you're in Linux, you will run ifconfig. Let's go through both of those. Here's my Windows desktop. Now I have a lot of different adapters configured in my machine because I have a lot of different virtual machines and other things that I'm doing. So I'm going to use uh, some other commands along with the ipconfig. I'm going to use the more command so that it paginates for us, does a whole page, and then it'll let us pause for a moment. And then I'll hit Enter. And you can see that it's showing that I have a virtual box, virtual machine running on here. The one that is my physical Ethernet card that's connected right now to the network is this Ethernet adapter for this Broadcom internal card. And you can see the DNS suffix that I have here. I'm running 192.168.0.7 as my IP address. I'm running a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. And I'm running a default gateway 192.168.0.1. So if I wanted to ping my default gateway, I would run the ipconfig command. And then I would ping whatever it came up with as my default gateway. And if I can do 192.168.0.1, I can see that I'm on this network and the IP address is properly pinging my default gateway. So I feel pretty good that the configuration of this machine is configured properly. Let's look at the same thing over in a Linux type environment. Here's my Linux desktop. I'm going to run, instead of ipconfig, we run the Linux equivalent with it, which is ifconfig. And when I do that, it shows me I have two network adapters configured here. I have an ETH0 and one that is a loopback adapter. So ETH0 is the one connected to the network right now. You can see it has an internet address of 192.168.0.13. There's my broadcast address, my subnet mask. So now I know exactly what my configuration is. I should be able to ping my default router now of 192.168.0.1 and see that, yes, indeed, it is communicating properly out there, just as my Windows environment was, because these are on the same subnet. And everything appears to be working just fine. So with those two commands, I can really gather everything I need to know about my local machine so that I can then start performing some other utilities out there to the network. Now that we know our IP address and the IP configuration of our local machine, let's start communicating out to the network. There's two ping commands that you'll want to be aware of. One is called ARP ping and one is called ping. Now ARP ping is taking advantage of this fundamental TCP IP protocol called ARP or address resolution protocol. IP won't work unless ARP is working. So ARP always has to work. That's the way that we know what the MAC address is of the devices that are on our local subnet. Uh, ping works a little bit differently. Ping is uh, a front end for ICMP echo requests. And it can go out to other subnets. It doesn't just work on our local subnet. And the problem with ICMP, though, is that it isn't enabled everywhere. Some people will administratively turn off ICMP. Some people will make it so you cannot communicate via ICMP. But it, it works across subnets. So if you know you can ping a device, at least you can run some tests to that device. We've already done a couple of pings already. But let's do an ARP ping and a ping and see what the differences are. The Windows operating system does not include an ARP ping by default. There are some open source alternatives that you can load. But since it's not in the operating system, then what I thought we would do is just go to a Linux desktop and give you a feel for what that looks like. Now remember, ARP ping only works on our local subnets. What I'm going to do is perform an ARP ping to my local gateway. So the command is ARP ping. And I'm going to do to 192.168.0.1, because that's my local machine. 
uh, local machines gateway. So I'm going to see if I can ping it. And indeed I can. Notice the response I get back is that this is the reply, but the reply is of this MAC address. So I'm not running ICMP requests out to that device. I'm performing ARPs to that IP address. And the machine that's answering back for those ARPs is the machine that has this MAC address. If I want to do another one, let's do dot two and see if there's a dot two on my network. There does not appear to be a dot two on this network. Let's see if there's a dot seven. And there is. Notice the dot seven has a completely different MAC address than this. Let's do one that goes out to a machine outside of my subnet, 4.2.2.2. We're not going to get any response there. ARPs will not work outside of our local subnet. So I could try to do an ARP ping to that device, but we're not going to get anything back from that machine. So I can go ahead and control C on that one. Now we know earlier that our ping command, we've done that one before. Let's ping our default gateway, for instance. We know that it sends ICMP requests and gets ICMP requests back or responses to our ICMP. And unlike the ARP ping, I can go out to 4.2.2.2 and get responses back from that device. So that's a good example of how ARP ping and ping are different and the different advantages and disadvantages. So now you should be able to know if you want to be able to see ARPs and do something on your local subnet, ARP ping will always work for you. But if you do have to go outside your subnet, you're going to have to run a ping. Traceroute is a command we've talked about in previous modules because sometimes you need to know the route that a packet takes to go from point A to point B. And the way this works is that it uses the ICMP protocol and the time to live capabilities. As this traffic is going through the network, it sets a time to live to one and sees where the traffic comes back and gives us a response back saying that it went as far as it could. Then it sets it to two and sees what the second router is before we get a response back and sets it to three and so on. So by doing that, we can track packets router by router by router through the network and get a feel for what path our packets take to get to a remote location. Let's try it and see what responses we get if we go out to Google. Traceroute is included in Windows. So let's run it from our Windows desktop. I'm going to run a traceroute. It's trace RT. And I'm going to do it to www.google.com and hit Enter. And what you're going to see happening is the traceroute command will go out, give us some timestamp information if it's able to receive an ICMP from a device. And then it will keep going step by step by step. One of the challenges I have with my particular local router is that it won't respond to an ICMP. So I see this request timed out initially. But once it got past my machine, it goes out to all of these other routers out there to tell me what's going on back and forth between me and those routers. Anytime we don't get a response back, we get a little asterisk here. There are cases where we are not getting responses back from certain routers. And it does it three times in a row. And we start to see this response go back and forth until it finally gets, looks like it's getting close to Google anyway. And then finally, our trace is complete. Look at all the paths we had to step through just to get from point A to point B and see what was happening over at Google. And now if we wanted to uh, identify where we are going, notice we went from our Tallahassee routers. It looked like we went to Mobile, Alabama. We went to Dallas. We hopped back to Atlanta. And then finally, probably somewhere in Atlanta are some servers for Google. So this is a, just a process that takes us all around the country before we ever got back to our Google location. But it all happens behind the scenes. The idea is that we can now track, though, every step along the way, which way it goes. Well, if you like ping and you like traceroute, you're really going to like MTR. This is a great little utility. It combines all of those together, and it gives you a little bit extra. I'm going to show you some of this extra part in just a moment. This currently is something that only runs in a Linux-type environment, a Unix-type environment. It's not currently one that you can find in Windows. If you want to find, look out there, there are some open source versions that were run in previous versions of Windows. Your mileage may vary on that one. This stands for Matt's trace route. It also stands for my trace route. It depends on where this was during the evolution of this. It's a program that's been around for a long time, started by Matt Kimball and Roger Wolf has taken over with some of those pieces, but it has some longevity in the industry. It's one that's almost become universal in a Linux or Unix type desktop. So let's run our MTR. Let's see what this is going to look like. I'll do an MTR, and we'll do another one to Google since we did that one before. And when I hit Enter, notice that it does kind of a full screen view now. 
and it's showing me every step along the way. And notice that it's updating these pings that it's doing. It's showing me packet loss. It's showing me the last value that I got from that particular router, what the average has been, the best, the worst, and a standard deviation of those. So when I said it had a little bit of extra in there, boy, it's got some great extra utilities here. And I can see the paths as it's going there. Notice I have some options on the top. I can change things like my display mode. If I hit D, it shows me ping information. You can watch it as it's pinging through that particular link. A D again shows me information about the last 50 pings and what it's sending and receiving. And then we can go back to our original view here. And if I, I can go through this process of understanding from my trace route what it's doing and where it's going, and I can just let this run. And I can see, am I ever going to drop frames? What's my average ping rates back to these devices? When you're working inside of a corporate environment where there's so many different variables, this can also be extremely useful. So this is not just something that you would use to go out to Google and see what the steps are. This can really be useful almost in anybody's environment. Here's a little utility that sounds kind of simple, but it actually comes in really handy. It's called Hostname. This is something you can run from a Windows desktop, from a Linux command line, if you just want to know what host you're on. And although that seems simple, shouldn't you know what host you happen to be on? If you're someone who hops from machine to machine or you're sitting in one place and you have a lot of remote desktop screens up, you may not remember exactly which machine you're on at any particular time. So hostname allows you to see what is the name of the machine I happen to be on. Let's see it in my Windows environment and see what's there. Here's my Windows desktop hostname, pretty complicated. We type hostname and hit enter, and it tells us the name we happen to be on. It's that simple. So if you are at a lot of command lines, you've got a lot of remote desktops up, and you can't remember what machine am I on right now, hostname is what will give you that information. We occasionally find ourselves troubleshooting problems with name services and name resolution. And there's two commands you should remember to help you with that. One's called nslookup and the other is called dig. nslookup and, and dig allow us to see what a DNS server has inside of its database for a particular host name or a particular IP address. nslookup will run in both a Windows and a POSIX-based environment, POSIX being that Linux or Unix type environment. It will look up names and IP addresses and tell us what the workstation sees related to that. DIG is a little more complex. It provides a lot more information. It stands for Domain Information Groper. It is a more advanced NS lookup, if you will, and it can give you information about what other DNS servers are seeing. So not just from a workstation's perspective, and there are a lot of different command line utility functions available if you're using DIG. Let's try both of those and see what we get. Since we can run nslookup and dig from the Linux command line, I thought we'd just do both of them there. So let's run an nslookup and look, let's look for uh, Google. Why not? What IP address is Google coming from? And it will tell us that uh, the server we're talking to is 0 0.1, and it tells us an answer being Google Navigation Open DNS. So I'm using an Open DNS server here, and I can see that Google has two IP addresses associated with it at Open DNS. So Google has more than one IP address. It actually has a couple that I can pull information from. So if I do a dig, what do I get? Let's just do a dig to the same name. I want to dig google.com, you can see the output that we get much more detailed. So if you want to see what the exact query was that we were doing, what the exact response was in a DNS format, if you're familiar at all with DNS servers and the format they use in their databases and what you would put in your uh, answer uh, database names, you can see that this answer section shows us exactly what we would have there. So you can see Google information uh, to open DNS. You can see that it, the type of cano canonical name that it's using, the IP addresses associated with that name, the query times, the servers, just a lot of information. And if you're trying to troubleshoot a DNS problem, DIG is probably a perfect utility to use to be able to get detailed information of exactly what's going on back and forth between you and that name server. In a previous module, we were looking at problems with routing, routing loops and routing problems that we were having. The way that we would view a routing table on, an, on a machine that we're using is a command called route. It works a little bit differently if you're in Windows versus a POSIX-based environment, but uh, the commands lines are very, very similar. They're just off just a little bit. Let's try one in Windows. I'll give you a feel for what this looks like. 
In Windows, if we type route, we get a lot of different options here of what we could be using for a route command. I'll scroll back up here and you can see all the different options that you would be able to use. The one that I want to see is just to print out what's in the routing view. You see you can route print, route add, route delete, route change. You could change a lot of the things that are going on in your machine with this route command. I'm just going to do a route print and you can see on my machine, let me scroll back up here. A lot of information when I do a route print. All the different uh, adapters that I have in my machine. I have quite a few in my machine. Uh, the routing table that I have, because I have so many route uh, adapters in my machine, I have a big routing table here. And here's an IPv6 routing table also there, along with a list of what might be any persistent routes if they're there. Everything you would ever need to know about routing on a Windows machine. The route command on my Linux desktop is a little simpler. I just type route, and you can see what my... Uh, routes are uh, configured in this in this machine. If I do a route print, I notice it doesn't work. It's not like Windows. So it's a little different if you're going from a Windows environment or a Linux, but you do still have a lot of good information in route. There's a verbose command, for instance. If I do a route slash, uh, dash V is the default verbose view. I can do a route dash E and get the extended mode, which puts a little bit more information in here about segment sizes and some other things. But a very easy way to be able to tell whether I'm in Windows or whether I'm in Linux, exactly what this machine sees from a routing perspective. If you've worked a lot in a Windows environment over a network, you're probably already familiar with the MBT stat command. This is a Windows only command because this refers to NetBIOS running uh, over TCP IP. So we want to see statistics, connections. I want to see host names. There's a lot of different functionality with MBT stat. MBT stat from the Windows command line. Let's run it and I'll just do it without any parameters and you can see all the different pieces that you can do here. I can see adapter status. I can see cache information, the names that I've resolved. I can try to list a sessions table with a particular IP address. I can release sessions. There's a lot of different things that I can do related to this. And if I do an MBT stat dash A and then give uh, the IP address that I'd like to pull information from, I can see out there what this 0 0.7 is. So 192.168.0.7 tells me that it's on this machine. I can see its name, what it's registered with. And there are also other local area connections on this machine. This is my local machine. There's quite a lot here. So if you ever need to be able to pull from a device, what machine is it on? What work group is it on? Is it connected to anything? And what is it connected to? The MBT stack command will give you all of that type of information. Well, the MBT stack command is great for a Windows environment, but if you're in a Linux type environment, you still need to know what's connecting to what, what devices are connecting to a machine, am I listening on any particular ports? And I can do all of that with a command called netstat. Netstat is also available in a Windows environment. So if you're interested in just pure TCP IP statistical information, netstat is the command we should be using. Netstat, either in Windows or in Linux, is a very powerful command with a lot of different options. I'll give you an idea from my Windows environment. I'll just do a question mark, and you can see quite a few options available here. All connections and listening points, the executables that created these connections, Ethernet statistics, displaying fully qualified domain names, and so on. So there's quite a bit here. And if I do one of these that shows a lot of information, netstat-a, look at all of the different connections going in and out of this device, the IP addresses they're communicating to, the port numbers that are associated with those IP addresses, a wealth of information. And whether you're in Windows or whether you're in Linux, it's similar types of front ends with similar type of information. Uh, you just need to be able to run the netstat command. You'll be able to see everything this machine's doing across the network. Let's see what we've learned with some of these command line options. Our first question is, what command line utility can query DNS servers from the workstation's perspective? There were two DNS commands we used, but one of them was really what the workstation saw. Do we remember what that was? NSLOOKUP, that's our answer. Second question, which nifty command line utility combines ping and traceroute? That was a nifty utility, wasn't it? And its name is MTR. And the last question, which command line utility provides TCP IP and interface information on POSIX-based systems? 
Which one was that? It was if config, so that we can see exactly how that machine's configured. Well, that summarizes what we needed to know from our command line tools module, where we've gone through the trace routes and IP configs and if configs and a lot of those other command line utilities. And so now you should be very comfortable with some of those commands you can run at the command line to be able to help you troubleshoot what's going on over your network. If you'd like to see many more of our Network Plus videos, if you want to participate in our message boards or send me a message, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.